Hello, everyone. Jeff here is uh, probably familiar with many, to many of you, but I'll just give him a quick intro. He's worked at Google since 1999. He started out building some early versions of the company's search and advertising infrastructure, and he's built a whole lot of other cool stuff as well. More recently, he's become tangled up in artificial neural networks, and he now leads the Google Brain Research Group, uh, which works on machine learning. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And most excitingly, uh, Jeff has come straight from the airport, straight from Seoul, Korea, where he has been part of the team uh, watching the software AlphaGo take on uh, the Go World Champion. It's two games up right now. Yes, yes, it's very exciting. It's, uh, it was quite an atmosphere. The Koreans like their Go quite a lot, and there was an unbelievable amount of press interest, and uh, it's actually pretty tense watching the game. Like, um, but uh, yeah, so far, it's going well for the computers, but uh, he's a very good player, so right. who knows and, what will happen. And tell us a bit about what it's like when you're watching <laughs> AlphaGo play. So you have a, have a look into AlphaGo's thinking, as it were. It's, an, it's take on how the game is going that, that other people can't see from the outside. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it's always assessing what the probability is that uh, it's going to win from the current board position. So you kind of see a little graph, like, going up or dipping or going up. Um, and that's you know kind of interesting to get that kind of real-time view of what it, it, it assesses its chances are. Okay, and the DeepMind team who who built this, you said it was tense. So were they, they weren't sure they were going to win going in. Um, I mean, they don't really know, like because they've never played a player that strong. Right. Um, so I think it was mostly the unknown. They were reasonably confident because they'd been assessing the system strength in other ways, and it looked pretty strong. But uh, And also just the kind of mundane things like their network connection from the hotel. Right. Seeing that first move come out was also uh, a relief, I guess. OK. You know, they had and triply redundant network connections. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. And uh, AlphaGo is poised to take the match. Um, they're taking a break today. They play again tomorrow. Um, what, what would it mean if the world human world champion you know, gives way to a machine world champion? Well, I mean, I think Go is kind of the last unsolved board game because it has uh, so much more complexity than chess. Uh, you know, chess was uh, uh, done by Deep Blue about 15 years ago now. Uh, but Go has kind of remained the, the main bastion of human, human mastery over computers mm. in board games. And so this is kind of a big event in that, in that respect. OK. And uh, we've, we've heard a lot in recent years about new benchmarks being set, very significant new benchmarks being set by machine learning in all kinds of fields, particularly in perception, images, mm -hmm. and speech, and that kind of thing. Um, we, we're living in this moment where it seems like maybe machine learning and artificial intelligence are bounding forward. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think one of the things about the machine learning field in the last five or six years is that it's um, unlike a lot of other fields of computer science, it's very fast moving at the moment. Uh, you know, in other fields, people will tend to submit a paper to a conference, and then like nine months later, when the conference makes a decision, they'll post the paper on the web or something. Uh, and in the machine learning field, people tend to put out their research almost immediately on Archive, which is a public paper hosting site. And other research groups, top labs around the world, all digest that paper almost immediately. And within a week or two, you'll see kind of improvements and changes and uh, enhancements of that work put out by other groups. And that, that I think, is really remarkable, that kind of like weekly improvement in, in sort of the research people are doing, the results they're getting. It, it's pretty amazing. OK. And as, as well as pushing forward these research results, your group also works on trying to spread these new techniques. So you, you want to move them, and you have moved them very quickly from you know, fresh research papers into actual deployment, people yeah. using it. Yeah, let me show our first slide. So um, <clears throat> you know, our group started in 2012 to really look in earnest at using deep neural networks uh, in uh, both for research purposes to understand what their capabilities would be in lots of areas of perception and language understanding, but also to use them in real products. And over time, we've worked with some of our product groups to kind of integrate these things into uh, products. One of the first products we worked with was the speech uh, recognition team. That was in 2012. And they rolled out a, a series of enhancements using deep neural nets to really improve the speech recognition accuracy. 
And then we worked pretty closely with a bunch of image-related teams, so our Street View team and image search teams. Uh, and over time, other teams would see the success of you know, applying machine learning in that way to, their, to other teams' problems that are similar to theirs. And so they would kind of um, come to us or come to that other team and say, hey, that sounds similar to us. So we've had this nice snowballing effect now. And one of the really nice properties about neural nets is that they're really broadly applicable to a whole bunch of different areas. You can kind of feed them different kinds of training data, images or speech or text, and really get very different kinds of models, but the fundamental technology is the same. Right. And, and there are so many examples here. It seems like it's popping up on all parts of the business. Is it just that people are able to take on problems that were intractable before, or are you also seeing these networks beat out existing models that were in use and product? Uh, it's a little bit of each. So I think in a lot of cases, especially in the perceptual domains, for that, especially in computer vision, you know, the system, we just didn't have systems that could do enough to make real products out of. Uh, in other cases, we already had like, uh, you know, spam classification or things. We already had machine learning systems in place um, and we've now replaced those systems or augmented them with, with neural net systems that work better, but that's a bit more of a, you know, an, uh, an improvement in capability rather than a completely new product area or product. Okay. And a lot of, particularly lately, a lot of these deployments uh, built on this system TensorFlow. Right? Yes. So, yes. Um, and, and you decided from the beginning, I think even before you uh, started to build it, you wanted to make that an open source package that you could re release to the world. So tell me how, how that came to be. Why, why do we need TensorFlow? Sure. So uh, in 2012, we started building our first system. And we kind of used that for about four years for all these different deployments. Uh, and then based on what we learned, we wanted to make a system that was as good as our first system in the aspects that we liked, uh, but also had some nicer <coughs> properties with respect to uh, being able to really easily express lots of different kinds of machine learning models. Our first system wasn't super flexible. Um, and so we decided we would uh, develop TensorFlow, our second generation system, and we would also open source it because we felt like the ability to exchange ideas with machine learning researchers outside of Google was a very powerful one, being able to sort of publish a model or publish a, a, a thing alongside a, a research paper just makes things much more tangible and allows people to build off your work much more readily. OK. And so TensorFlow was released last year. Um, people are already building stuff with it. Yeah. So in November last year, uh, we released it. It's actually now the number one uh, machine learning repository in GitHub. Um, and people have done all kinds of different things with it. So this is one of, I think, 800 uh, different GitHub repositories that use TensorFlow on GitHub that lots of people in the external community have done. This is, uh, uh, if you saw Jeremy Howard, Howard's talk about the uh, making a, taking a photo and painting, rendering it in the style of a particular painter, this is a TensorFlow implementation of that that someone has done uh, using uh, TensorFlow. So you can get TensorFlow and then get this repository and it, presto, you can, you can do that yourself or modify that code or whatever. It's pretty nice. OK. And um, <coughs> so a lot of the projects with neural art may be a side projects, but you think TensorFlow is going to be something that people use in production in all types of businesses as well? Yeah, one of the one of the principal design principles we had when building it is we wanted it to go be able to go from sort of easily expressing research ideas, but also take that same system that you've now hopefully got good research results from, and then put it into production and have it run in a bunch of different kinds of settings. So some of our deployments are running on a mobile device, so actually running the model on the device. Some are running in data centers. You know, you can train on a single machine, or you can train on a large collection of machines if you have them. Um, so it's meant to be pretty flexible in that regard. OK. And so there will be different um, very large groups like yours with a lot of resources will use this, but startups can will build on TensorFlow as well. Everyone will get a chance, you think? Yeah, it was the most forked repository on GitHub last year, despite being out in November. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see. Um, that's interesting. So you've worked with machine learning for a long time. Um, describe to me how, the, how this technique is going to be different. So it used to be something that was very specialized and, and, and hard to do. There was a small group of wizards that you had to hire if you wanted to get into this. And now 
well, what will it be like in a few years? Like everyone in the industry will be able to just. Yeah. So I think you know there's uh, kind of a collection of things. There's uh, some of the researchers in our team worked on this interesting research problem, for example, of being able to take a, an image like that, the pixels of an image, and being able to generate a, a human level caption of that. And so that that bottom sentence is what the model generates given those pixels. And if you'd asked me, you know, four or five years ago, can a computer write sentences like that about about an image? I would have said, I don't think so. Uh, but actually, it turns out that these models are very powerful, and, and we, we can do that. Um, so I think there's several levels of kind of ways that people can take advantage or use machine learning. One is, if you're a machine learning researcher, TensorFlow at a low level is really good because it's flexible and allows you to use, you know, express exactly the kind of machine learning model you want and try lots of things. Um, there's kind of a middle level of people with problems for which machine learning is applicable that are similar to other problems that other people have already solved using machine learning. Like maybe you have an image classification problem, but your classification problem is you want to distinguish you know, 100 kinds of mushrooms. Uh, so you can take an image model that someone else has trained and just collect some image, uh, some mushroom training data and start training on that data and use that without necessarily being a machine learning expert. You sort of change some file names and you start training and, and away you go. Um, and then there's a third class of people that I think uh, don't even want to do that level of machine learning. They just want something that allows them to take advantage of the kinds of things machine learning can do. Hmm. Um, so as an example of that, uh, we've recently released our Cloud Vision API. So this is uh, an API that anyone can use. You just upload an image, and back come a bunch of interesting annotations on that image. So for example, if you upload the image on the left, we'll tell you we think that's running and likely to be related to a marathon. And on the right, we can find faces in the image, and we can tell you, you know, that person's happy, and that we find text in the image. Right. So that's clearly pretty useful. You don't need to re know, really know anything about machine learning, even though it's using machine learning under the covers. So I think there's these three different levels. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, you might see people who are using this level uh, move down a level and want to train their own models. Uh, or people training their own models might want to do more sort of research and explore kind of the variety of different kinds of models for their particular problem. So. Right. <clears throat> OK. And as, um, as it becomes easier, um, some people say that uh, data is going to become an even more important resource. I mean, that seems to be, I mean, that's so important, right? You can't train a model without data. And now it seems like building the model might be the easy part. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that's really helped push the, the vision community forward, for example, is the availability of the ImageNet uh, data set, which is a publicly available data set of uh, you know, a few million photos labeled with tags like running or marathon or whatever. Um, and so I think uh, having data sets like that publicly available really pushes the community forward. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and certainly, you know, there's public data sets. Often people within their own companies have uh, data stored in some storage system that could be used as the, the training data for a machine learning system. You know, if people have information about customers and they want to predict, you know, which customers are likely to spend money in November or December or something, that's, you know, readily doable with data they probably already have. Um, right. That's, that's an interesting point. There was, over the last few years, there were some giant silos of information that piled up and now there's some new tools to apply to them. Um, you mentioned <coughs> how the research on images has moved forward very, very fast. I mean, it's, it's really impressive, stuff like that, captioning. Um, but there's so much still to figure out, right? Um, Go is beaten, but you know, lots of other problems we can't build systems to take on. What are the big open research questions for, for your group uh, looking ahead over the next five or 10 years? Right. Uh, I mean, I think the. One of the main unsolved challenges in machine learning is how do you deal with unsupervised data? Data where you're training a model and you don't, uh, in supervised training, you have an input and then you have the desired output for that model, for that example. So you would have an image like that and it would say, you know, that's a marathon. Um, but in unsupervised data, you just have the image, unsupervised training. And so how do we? take advantage of the fact that there's a huge wealth of data in the world that is not labeled by humans, but 
could be used to augment the training we have for the limited number of, of labeled examples that we do have. Right. So uh, that's one of the key challenges, I think. Okay. Um, and in terms of kind of other application areas that I think are going to be exciting, I think uh, the area of robotics is going to be uh, really important now. Now that computers can see, clearly it's going to be really uh, important for robotics. Uh, I think healthcare has got a lot of interesting applications of machine learning right. um, that have a lot of potential. Okay. And um, speak a little bit about language. That seems something like something where it feels like there may be some quite near-term big steps forward. I know that you, your people in your team have been working on translation yes, quite yes. a lot recently. Um, there's the, I think at least one person has cited this today, the smart replies function in, mm -hmm. in uh, Gmail. Yeah, so actually that, that's a good example of a research project that some people in my team did uh, to do translation, uh, basically mapping one sequence onto another, to another sequence. And the framing in translation is the first sequence is like an English sentence, and the desired output sequence is the corresponding French sentence or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, but it turns out that framing is pretty general. You can use this for emails. So the input sequence would be the email you received, and the output sequence would be the reply you're likely to generate. Right. Um, and we're now sort of working with our translation team to see if we can scale this up to the, the production translate product. I think we'll, we'll have some good results coming down the pike there. But okay. uh, so it's not yet using the neural translation model. OK, I look forward to it. I think we have time for one more question. So maybe we could loop back to where we started, which was with AlphaGo. You, you, meant, you mentioned that Go seems to be the last board game uh, to, to fall. What, <clears throat> assuming it's useful to set up these big challenges, what's, um, what's a good target to take on next? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think uh, things that require taking actions in um, messier spaces. Like Go is a very clean space. There's you know, you know, 200 places or something you can move on the board at any given, given turn. Um, and the real world is much more complicated and messier. You know, it's right. not like there's exactly 200 discrete things I can do sitting on the stage. Mm -hmm. um, so figuring out how to build more intelligent systems that can operate in these messier environments, I think, is, is one. Um, one, one technique that the DeepMind group is probably going to pursue is sort of um, more complicated games uh, like right. StarCraft, I think Demis has mentioned, is a, mm -hmm. a likely next target. That has some interesting properties because you can't observe the entire state of the game based on your view. You have to kind of remember what's happening off the screen in some sense and, mm -hmm. and develop sort of higher level abstractions of, of that data. Um, so things like that I think are interesting. You know, I think robotics will actually generate some messier settings when you actually have real robots rather than simulated robots. OK, good. So we can look forward to more uh, high profile matches between humans and machines. Uh, yes, perhaps, <laughs> for the benefit uh, of all. OK, good stuff. Great. I think that brings us to, uh, to time. So Jeff, many thanks for joining us today. Sure. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you.